Well, hello everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this eight-week environmental education series by renowned climate scientist, Dr. Tom English. My name is Dave Rice and I'll be your host for this event. Dr. English has accomplished many things in his rich and varied career, with much of it having to do with improving our environment. He was the author of the California Clean Air Act in the late 80s, which resulted in the elimination of all the smog we experienced back then. He's met and collaborated with dignitaries around the world and has earned a Congressional Medal of Honor on behalf of the Patriarch Bartholomew for their work together on climate. One of the things I appreciate the most about Tom is his unusual ability to communicate difficult concepts in very easy to understand ways. He has a huge passion for educating others on our current climate crisis and the existential threats it's bringing to us and to our children's generations. We all need to be aware of what can be done to counter this. The goal of this series is to help you more clearly understand the main issues behind climate change and what can be done about it, so you can have better discussions with family and friends and become more involved in helping make a difference. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tom English. Tom, can you tell us about the purpose of the series? And the purpose of these eight uh, discussion sessions that we're having is basically to uh, make you more comfortable when you talk about environmental things to your friends, uh, to your relatives, uh, to your children, uh, et cetera. Uh, I think that uh, when people can talk to each other about, uh, about various issues in a way that's understandable, what happens is we come to better solutions. So that's the goal of uh, what we're doing here. Uh, basically, we're gonna discuss a wide variety of things. Uh, Today, we'll focus on giving you some sort of perspective on the environment so that you can basically uh, understand what's, how things work in terms of uh, we have problems, we solve the problems. By solving the problems, this generates new problems. We then again solve those. New problems come out of the woodwork somehow. Uh, we, we solve those. And it basically gives you some sort of feeling for, the, for that. Then we're gonna talk about how life works on the planet, uh, how we've had uh, five mass extinctions and maybe in the beginning of the sixth mass extinction, depending on whatever you folks do. If we play our cards right, things will be great. If not, it won't be. We'll talk about the weird weather that's going on there and now make some sense out of that. We'll get you uh, comfortable with climate change so you understand what it is. We'll talk about our energy futures, whether we basically get a lot of jobs and uh, lead a better quality of life. I will do a side thing about uh, nuclear energy, uh, nuclear waste on the beach. It's a popular topic here in California. Then we'll talk about the religious side of things. We have a, a talk that's called the Pope, the Patriarch and the Rabbi. Uh, so we'll get some idea how the religious folks function in here. It sounds like one of those jokes that you hear, the Pope, the Patriarch and the Rabbi went into a bar then finally, we'll get down to, to COVID. And basically, we'll talk about the idea of, uh, have we learned anything from the COVID experience uh, that we can apply to the next experience that's coming up on us, climate change? So that's going to be it. So we hope you can have a good time. And we'll switch to the uh, slides here. It's where we're going to have a couple sessions of Q&A during the talk. And uh, what we'll do is we'll do that through the chat room. And then we'll have some more detailed Q&A, sort of a free-for-all, if you like, at the end. Uh, well, we can go on as long as we like. So I really, I thrive on the questions. So please uh, don't, don't be shy about giving me questions. So today uh, we're talking about environmental perspectives and really keeping track of the environment is really like a, a, a wild roller coaster ride. Uh, There's a picture of me and the, one of my kids and two of my grandkids at Lego Land. We had a great time on the roller coaster there. We're going to examine some common threads to problems like massive fish kills, air pollution, maybe talk about LA a little bit, uh, acid rain, and climate change. We're going to figure out something that's kind of radical, and that is how we can solve these problems simultaneously while increasing our quality of life. So I think that's going to be an interesting topic. Here's the flow for today. First, we'll talk about population. Then we'll talk about water. Water determines, for example, the economics of most countries. Talk about air and then climate change. So let's get on with population. During the time of Christ, uh, there, there uh, were maybe uh, 200 million people uh, romping around the earth. 
So there weren't very many. Uh, it took a while to get to 1 billion. Uh, that was during the time of Abraham Lincoln. And then from Abraham Lincoln to my being born, uh, we, that was a fairly shorter period of time. Uh, we got to, we doubled the, the population from 1 billion to 2 billion. And then 4 billion, and currently we're just, just south of uh, 8 billion. So what's happening is we're getting a lot of people. And let's just make some projections about growth. Uh, if we continue going the way we are from 2021, we're at 7.7 .7 billion. If we go out a little bit in time, about 43 years, uh, we're doing the same things we're doing now uh, without any of the fixes that we have. And we get to about 14 billion people. So that's a lot of more people. We have a lot of interesting situations there. If we go on at the same rate for 700 more years, we end up with enough people so that if we stack them over the whole earth, including the oceans, uh, we'll be stacked uh, one person per square foot. So what people will look like is a bunch of cordwood stacked all over the planet. And each of us, it generates some heat like a light bulb. So each of us is equivalent to like a 100 watt light bulb. So the heat from each of us will be uh, creating a temperature on the surface of the earth uh, greater than that of boiling water. So we'll really be, as they say, in hot water. So it's, it's a question of how do you, maybe you can handle that through some sort of space radiator invention or something. But basically the idea is that you just can't keep on going uh, the way we're going with people. We have to figure, step up to the problem and figure out how to uh, pick a sensible number of people. If we don't, the problems will be solved by the four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, death, pestilence, war, and famine. And it's much better if we can uh, solve the problems through some, some thoughtful process instead of going through those ugly processes. Let's talk a little bit about water to get to uh, some things that uh, are traditionally called environmental. This is something you may have heard about. I don't know how many of you have ever experienced it. Uh, it's called a chamber pot. And what it used to be used for is uh, when people went to bed at night, uh, they might have a problem where they had to go to the toilet and this is where they would go to the toilet at night. So not, a, not exactly a very convenient kind of thing. It led to all kinds of problems. You collect the stuff and then take care of it in the morning. Uh, this is how you would often take care of it. If you lived on the second floor, uh, you would simply throw it out, uh, out the window. And this was not very pleasant for the people who walked uh, underneath there. So a lot of problems there. Uh, this is, by the way, this is where the custom of men walking on the outside of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, the sidewalk came from. I guess they were thought to be a little bit more expendable in their dress than the ladies. So we decided to solve that somehow or other. So what they did is they invented an uh, indoor toilet. And uh, contrary to urban legend, Sir Thomas Crapper uh, did not invent the toilet. The toilet was actually invented by uh, a grandson of Queen Elizabeth I. His name was Sir John Harrington. So that's where we get the expression, John and Crapper. <laughs> so what happened is you had that waste from the toilet, you had to go down some pipes into some sort of sewage system, and you had to basically figure out how to make that sewage system work, and then you dumped it into the rivers or streams or creeks or whatever. This is an example of, uh, of, uh, of one poorly designed system. This is in China. And what happened there is this giant fish kill here. 132,000 pounds of fish were killed in 2004. And so when those fish get killed by this stuff, it's, it stinks. It's really bad, bad stuff. And it causes people to get sick. So you want to come up with some invention to take care of that. So people came up with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the concept of a waste water treatment plant. So you take all this stuff running into the sewer, and you put it into this big plant and that would basically uh, take care of the people. What happened is along the way, uh, they discovered some things that uh, some of these pipes would leak. Like in London, there was a famous case where the, uh, the waste pipes were leaking into their fresh water supply and it killed an awful lot of people. So again, problem, solution, problem, solution, progress. In the U.S., for example, we had this to decide about rivers. Uh, I'm, I'm from Pittsburgh originally, and I learned to swim in the Ohio River. 
And the uh, first stroke you learn in the Ohio is the breast stroke. The reason for that is you have all this stuff floating in the river and you want to sweep it out in front of you <laughs> so you can move through the water. So the breast stroke. So the, many of the uh, cities, uh, their, their uh, rivers were becoming open sores. And we had to decide as a country, what, which is better, uh, open sores or some sort of pristine streams. And we struggled with that for maybe 50 years or so. Then what happened, it, it got solved all of a sudden by the, a, a weird thing. There was a, play, a river in near Cleveland called the Cuyahoga River, and the Cuyahoga River actually caught on fire. So this river is burning, and you know, rivers are used there for, for putting out fires. They're not supposed to be causing fires. So there's something wrong here. So in 1952, it got the attention of the, uh, of the nation, and they, they struggled with this idea, but they knew it was wrong to have rivers that catch on fire. And so we ended up with the National Clean Air Act, or the Clean Water Act, and that basically saved our, our, our rivers and streams. Let's take a couple questions and see what you're thinking about. Dave, do you have anything there? Yes, Tom, uh, we do. Um, two questions. The uh, first one is, isn't there a conflict between fixing the environment and keeping our jobs? Well, that's certainly something that uh, we hear a lot about. Uh, for example, in Pittsburgh, when I was a young kid, we thought that the, uh, the smoke coming out of the smokestacks was uh, good and it was causing us to win World War II. And, and the streetlights would come on in the afternoon in Pittsburgh <laughs> because of all the smoke. So we had a referendum there and we decided to uh, cause uh, the steel mills to clean up their act. And uh, the threat was if you force us in the steel mills to clean up our act, we will immediately move and uh, you will lose all these jobs. So anyway, the, the vote went in favor of cleaning up the steel mills and the steel mills got cleaned up and there weren't any jobs lost. So it worked pretty well. Uh, we heard the same thing in Los Angeles uh, where we, we, we think smog is really bad for you and harmful to your, the health and harmful to your children. But nevertheless, we can't afford the economics of it. So it turned out what they did is they, we, I was part of the process, we, we decided to clean up LA and we did, and it cost a lot of money. It cost about uh, $3 billion a year. It turned out that we were saving though uh, in excess of $9 billion a year. So it was an incredibly good uh, uh, economic investment to clean things up and the people have profited ever since. Uh, in Silicon Valley, we had the same sort of thing where the, uh, they, were, they were distributing a lot of toxic waste. Uh, there was more uh, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, the things that eat the ozone layer from Silicon Valley than from anywhere else on earth. And so what happened is uh, they decided to clean their act up. So I was in charge of a project there with about 125 companies and we reduced our uh, toxic waste by about 86% in four years and made billions of dollars. So uh, it, it's, not, it's, a, it's a false question to ask about the economy and the environment. If you take care of the environment and you do it sensibly, your economy thrives. It's funny, I got a, uh, a note in the chat, Tom, that says, uh, did you know that Randy Newman has a song about the uh, Cuyahoga River burning? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's called yeah. Burn On, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here's another question. Um, what's happening with the hole in the ozone layer? Well, uh, first of all, the, the, we'll talk a little more detail about the ozone layer a little bit later. The basic idea is that uh, this is like a screen that keeps uh, uh, radiation from the sun uh, from hitting the earth and, and harming us. Essentially, if you had no ozone layer, you could have no life on the planet earth. <laughs> I mean, it's that, it's that serious a thing. So basically, what happened is uh, we've had this ozone layer for billions of years and it's been working fine, but we're putting some chemicals up in the, uh, in the air that uh, basically eat a hole in the ozone. So we'll go into more details later, but basically we're in the process of solving the problem. Okay, this is again uh, back in Pennsylvania. There was a little town there called Donora, Pennsylvania. Uh, no one knows where Donora is. It's just one of these uh, little places off in the, off in the, the woods. Uh, 
it's it's a steel mill town right on the river, and uh, it had about population of about ten thousand people. So it's a small place, and uh, people had lived there for a long period of time. And what happened is one night, uh, something weird happened, and everybody started to get sick. There were like uh, ten thousand people admitted to the hospital, and I forget how many people uh, died, but there were like uh, oh. Oh, there we go. How many got sick? Five to 7,000 people got, got sick and 20 died. So all of a sudden it was like the angel of death had de descended upon Denora, Pennsylvania. And what happened? Well, what happened is something we're pretty familiar with in the LA area. There was an inversion layer that basically came, there's a low inversion layer and kept the smoke from spreading out. And it basically kept the smoke uh, where it built up where the people were and they got sick as all heck. And so people started worrying about this sort of thing. Then what happened is uh, no one thought about it much. So later on in 52 in London, you know, the, the famous London's fog, it turns out it's really the London smog. Uh, what happened there is uh, there was a shortage of flowers. So why in the world would there be a shortage of flowers? What had happened there? So people started investigating where are the flowers going? And they found out they were going to the uh, the funeral homes. So, okay, if you got all of a sudden a big demand on flowers for funeral homes, there must be people dying. So they started checking the records and they found out that a large number of people had died uh, in a short period of time because of this London smog. There were 12,000 deaths. So all of a sudden it was like, okay, we better start doing something about this. So people argued and fussed back and forth. And finally in 1970, uh, the US passed its Clean Air Act that basically would help get rid of these problems in US cities. And other cities around the world did the same sort of thing. So there was a need for progress. Uh, the, the stuff was coming out of the factories, out of the homes and whatever, and affecting the people, affecting their health. And so what we did is we did some things to, to fix, fix the problem. In 1970, uh, the Clean Air Act passed by the Congress required EPA to set national ambient air quality standards. Now, let me put that into some sort of language that makes some sense. Uh, basically, it says you, you guys in EPA have to figure out what it is in the air that makes people sick. And then and figure out, once you figure that out, is figure out numbers that say, if we keep these different pollutants below a certain level, people won't get sick. So that's the basic idea. So we looked at different things. We found that the dust in the air was one thing that got people sick. And in Pittsburgh, again, what would happen is the execs, whenever they went to work, would carry a brown bag. And many people thought the brown bag was their lunch. Well, it turned out it wasn't their lunch. What happens is the, the smoke in the air was so bad that the collars of the execs got to be black by lunchtime. And so what they did to keep looking half decent is they basically changed their shirt. And that was what was in the brown bag. So, so dust in the air was one thing that was affecting people. Oxides of uh, nitrogen dioxide was another thing. Carbon monoxide, that's the kind of stuff that kills you if you leave your car running in the garage. That's clearly important. Sulfur dioxide, the stuff that comes out of coal. And ozone, the famous thing that was the, the big problem in LA. So those were the big ones. So EPA came up with standards saying that you cannot exceed this level in, in your cities. I was fortunate enough to lead a health study in seven LA cities. It was called the CHESS program, Community Health Environmental Surveillance Studies. And we basically, with our studies, we checked to see whether or not the numbers that the people had picked uh, for the air quality standards made sense. And it turned out most of them were pretty good. But we had a problem with California because they, they thought it was a good idea to clean up the air, but they didn't want to spend any money on it. So they put together a uh, so-called state implementation plan that wasn't really any good. And it was obvious it wasn't any good. So EPA argued with them and they wouldn't do anything. So finally EPA threatened them with, uh, they, that EPA would stop paying the highway funds that California was getting uh, if, unless they play ball and they, they came up with a good way of cleaning up the air. 
And one of my uh, fun assignments was I had to come to LA representing the government and basically explain to everyone why that was being done. So I was on TV about 200 times during that visit. I also have, was lucky enough to be able to help out with the 1988 California Clean Air Act. The uh, earlier version of the act just didn't make any scientific sense. There were some real problems with it. And so what we did is we basically, instead of basing the act on computer models, models that predict this and that, we basically said, okay, we'll just use the data that's been around for 30 years in all these cities and base our decision making on that. And that really worked. It was very, very big success. So those are a few examples on air. Now, CO2 became linked to climate change. So again, we have CO2 coming out of various things and we have a problem for it. So what we did is we need more progress. So this, this fight went up to the Supreme Court. This is the US Supreme Court here. And basically uh, the Supreme Court told the EPA that you can't use the Clean Air Act to uh, to, to regulate this unless science justifies it on the basis of health effects. And so what they did is they examined health effects uh, and they came up with a, uh, a so-called endangerment finding. And the health effect was basically that if you uh, have too much CO2, uh, the air gets hotter than it usually would get. And that hot air kills a lot of people. And so the Supreme Court went along with it and that gave a gave EPA the right to uh, basically regulate uh, this uh, climate change pollution, CO2. So it became popular to say uh, in the environmental field that dilution is the solution to pollution. So that sounds kind of catchy, but let me show you why that's not a good, <laughs> a good answer. Uh, if we have a lot of stuff with we, we putting in some tall sm stacks, tall smokestacks to get the pollution far away from people, what happens is it does get far away from people. It goes high, it's carried by the wind, it mixes up with the clouds and the weather system and comes down dissolved in rainwater to form acid rain. And then with the acid rain, it kills the plant life, uh, the rivers, the streams, it erodes the stonework. So, what happened is, this is uh, again from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the lower the numbers, that means the pH is lower and lower, there's, there's more acid in the air. So the center for acid in the air was Pittsburgh. <laughs> and then it gets lower as you get further away and further and so forth. So there was a giant problem uh, with, uh, with that. Tree forests were dying, uh, lakes were becoming polluted, fish were dying. Uh, it was just really a serious problem. So what happened is we basically we looked at all the other things there. This is a statue, for example. This is a statue as, as it looked in uh, the early 1900s. And this is the, what it looked like in 1968. So you can see this thing was several hundred years old here. And now in that short period of time, it basically doesn't even look like a statue. <laughs> so the acid in the air was eating things up, eating people's lungs up also. So uh, there was a national acid rain program put together to reduce the CO2 by a large amount. And what happened is we, uh, we targeted the coal plants because that's where most of it was coming from. And we invented a technique called cap and trade where basically you were allowed to emit so much pollution. And if you had, uh, uh, if you emitted less than that, you could trade that amount of pollution for, uh, for money. So that became the popular thing and we're still stuck with it. It's, it works, but it works very, very slowly. And it's a very expensive program and there are much better options available today. Okay, so finally we get to the question that you asked earlier, the hole in the ozone layer. This represents the hole. <laughs> and let me give you an idea of what the ozone layer means. Now, basically, as you go up in the sky, uh, it gets colder. So if you leave the surface and you go up, it'll get colder. When you get up to where airplanes fly at all oh, 30, 40,000 feet or so, it's, it's very cold up there. And what happens is the pressure gets lower and lower. And then what happens is if you go higher into what's called the stratosphere, it's the beginning of the stratosphere there, is things actually start to warm up a little bit. So the ozone layer is about uh, 20 miles above where that happens. And this ozone layer, again, is protective of all the life on the planet. Again, if, if you didn't have an ozone layer, you couldn't have life on the surface of the planet. So 
this this purple thing is the satellite shot of the Earth. This this is the South Pole. Uh, this is North America over here. This is South America here. Um, this purple stuff basically indicates that we are uh, have lost a good bit of the of the protection of the uh, of the ozone layer there in that hole. That hole, just to give you an idea, is not a real small thing. It's about the size of North America. So this is a giant thing. And so we basically decided we had to do something about it. So what we did is we uh, used satellites and we used uh, U-2 airplanes. This is a military one. You can tell the military U-2 from uh, the, uh, uh, the peaceful one uh, because the military one is painted black. The peaceful one is, is painted white. So we basically, when I, when I worked at uh, Patrick Air Force Base uh, in my project, we had one of these as, uh, as part of our project. It's kind of fun to have your own U-2. So what happened is we found that the uh, ozone uh, is becoming deleted by 130% in, in the Antarctic spring. That was a big effect in near the South Pole. Uh, by a smaller amount, 22% in the Arctic, and about 7% in mid-latitudes. So the people of the world thought this was such a big problem. They instituted the world's first environmental agreement. It was called the Montreal Protocol. And what it did, since it's the first one of any time, it basically decided to solve the problem over a long period of time. So to speed things up, uh, the guys with the white U-2s, the NASA people, uh, decided to fly their U-2 over the northern part of the, of the hemisphere, and in particular have it cross a place in Maine uh, where President Bush used to go for his summer vacation, so a place called Kenny Bunkport, Maine. And they found out that the ozone layer has depleted by already by 10% there. This shook up Bush so much that he had the, the schedule, the, the global schedule changed. So they, they, they sped it up by about 15 years. So it was really a, 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 good, a good example of new data uh, changing uh, the way we do things. So any questions? We have, uh, we have a question about the inversion layer. Um, it just says, uh, can, can you explain it? What is an inversion layer? Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, what that normally happens is the, as you go up from the surface of the earth, uh, it gets colder. You can always experience that when they, you go on an airplane ride and they tell you the outside temperature is minus 50 degrees <laughs> and you may have left at 75 degrees at the airport. So it got colder as you went up. So what happens is, it's someplace in the atmosphere, it starts to get warmer again. So the place where it's going up and it's getting uh, colder meets the place where it's getting warmer, that's called the inversion layer. So the reason it's important is that if you have inversion layers, they can be at various heights depending on the, the meteorological situations. So that if you have a low level of inversion, what happens is if you put up a, co a column of, of smoke, uh, it can normally just keep on going and going and dilute and dilute and dilute. But if it hits the, uh, the inversion layer, it's like bumping into a lid. So all of a sudden there's a lid that keeps the stuff from going any further. So it's like someone built a wall there for the pollutant. So now instead of that pollutant just going out into space and spreading out all over the place, it stays right with you. And so your concentrations of that stuff can get very, very high. So that's what an inversion layer is about. Very good. And then um, we have uh, we have two questions from the uh, the last segment that was you know talking about the pollution in the ocean uh, just south of our border. What type of environmental damage is being done by the sewage in our ocean just south of our border? And another one that says border pollution is officially a public health crisis. The San Diego County has declared pollution in the Tijuana River Valley a public health crisis. Though the problem has roiled San Diego and Tijuana for decades, county officials had previously not taken this step. Well, again, that's a, that's a fairly complicated question because you're talking about an international border there. So you have the U.S. and then you have Mexico. So that makes it harder than just a U.S. problem or just a Mexico problem. But the basic idea is that you have that stuff uh, coming out and there's enough, of, uh, enough pollutants in there, uh, you can kill people with it. You can also get them sick at lower levels. So yeah, there are serious health effects. It also messes up the ocean, the, uh, the, the fish, 
uh, eat that stuff and they get sick. And so if you happen to get some of those fish that were swimming around there on your, on your meal at a restaurant, <laughs> it's not good for you. So it's, it's a serious problem. But what happens is some places uh, take problems more seriously than others. So that was considered a place that wasn't, uh, I guess, too serious. You know, uh, it's not like it's in the middle of LA. It's not like it's in the middle of uh, Pittsburgh or Chicago or whatever. And so I think what they did there is they tended to uh, lowball the, uh, the, uh, the solutions there. And so the way, the way you can get around lowballing of solutions is, is pretty simple. You simply stir up a lot of people and the people basically beat up on the politicians for not doing their jobs. <laughs> and then all of a sudden the money starts to magically appear. So I think that's the, uh, that's the path forward uh, for that problem. The problem gets a little more complicated because you've got uh, Mexico and the US there and you say so you have to have some sort of bilateral agreements and usually you get trade and things like that involved in, in the answer. But uh, yeah, it can be solved. and. Uh, I haven't seen the economic studies, but I'd be willing to bet that uh, that the cost of uh, of uh, solving it is far less than the cost of not solving it. Sounds like a, a major opportunity for some activism here. Um, we've got uh, we've got one more that I think would be worthwhile, Tom, if we can. Uh, so, how did the Montreal Accord address the ozone issue? Uh, what they did is they basically said what causes it first of all. And it basically is caused by a, a chemical called a, a chloro, meaning it has chlorine in it, fluoro, meaning it has fluorine in it, uh, hydrocarbon. So basically you take a, an, an ordinary methane molecule, which is basically you've got one carbon and four hydrogens and you know cows give off methane, for example. <laughs> you know, so methane is a fairly common pollutant. Uh, and you replace a couple of those uh, piece, a couple of those hydrogens with a chlorine and a fluorine. And if you do that, the stuff becomes very stable uh, as opposed to methane, which would fall apart in the atmosphere in a short period of time and become uh, water and carbon dioxide. So what happens is this thing becomes very stable. It drifts up higher than it would normally drift into the stratosphere and up into the ozone layer. And what it does there is it, uh, it basically forms an ice so it, it becomes like an icy sludge up there for uh, let's say three fourths of the year, but then it gets warm enough to melt the sludge. And so whenever, this, whenever it gets warm enough to melt the sludge, it now goes back to a gas and that gas goes out and it eats the, uh, the uh, ozone layer. It, it likes to eat up the ozone. So it decreases the ozone a lot. And that's what causes the hole in the ozone. And so this, these ultraviolet pollutants uh, from the sun basically go right through that hole and it can be uh, very dangerous. Uh, uh, I guess one of the dangers is like a sunburn. The uh, Australians are very, very worried uh, when, they, when they go surfing. Uh, they, they put an awful, awful lot of gunk on them because they uh, have been victimized by an awful lot of skin cancer. So that's one of the big drives, skin cancer. Also is tough on your eyeballs. It, uh, it basically can cause blindness in cows, things like that. So uh, it's not a, a good thing to have. Okay, let's talk about something that's very controversial. And you may have had some fun or some, uh, some sadness talking to your relatives about this issue. And so this would be one that's a, that's a good one to, uh, to talk about and get you comfortable with. Uh, I think it's uh, fairly understandable. It's just a matter of, uh, of starting at simple places and going to other simple places. So we'll try that out. Climate change is not a new, new idea. The first paper that I'm aware of, it was a big paper, I read the thing, it's about, it was about 20 pages long, uh, came out in 1896, written by a guy by the name of Sponte Arrhenius. And he basically said, found that as you uh, increase the amount of carbon dioxide or CO2 in the air, what happens is the, the planet heats up. And so uh, he thought that was a great idea because he lived in Sweden and he thought things were too cold in Sweden. <laughs> so it'd be wonderful if we could heat the planet up. 
he wasn't looking at all the effects, but uh, he thought just the one effect. So let's let's put more CO2 in the air and let's heat the planet up and make Sweden a, a more more comfortable place for, uh, for swimming in the in the rivers. So uh, anyway, he he, he was a, a very important guy. He was on the committee, the first committee to form the, the Nobel Prize Committee. So he knew Nobel and he was a big guy on the committee. So his, his data, by the way, is still quite accurate and uh, is still used. What, what he did is he predicted what was happening in a, in a small area of Sweden. And what we do today is we have big computers that take a couple of weeks to make a run and uh, they try to keep track of what's happening over the whole world. So that's an interesting problem. Here's the basic problem. You put a frog into hot water and what happens? You know, it jumps up. So nothing, nothing strange and uh, mysterious there. Now let's move on to the next thing of frogs, okay? You take a frog and we put him into very comfortable cool water. There he is, he goes in there and he just loves it. He thinks it's great and you turn the heat up under there and he thinks it's wonderful until he croaks. <laughs> so that's our problem with climate change. We're good as a species at handling problems that come up on us all of a sudden. Like uh, the COVID problem is an example. We're doing, uh, you know, even though it's, it's so awful, we're actually uh, acting fairly quickly on that thing. Whereas problem like carbon dioxide in the air, climate change, that's one of those ones where things change slowly and there we had work on it uh, in 1898, and we're still still struggling with the issue. So that's the problem of, of gradual problems. We're not good at gradual problems. We just don't have it in our DNA. Now, this is a, a graph that I love to use because I, I spared no expense at making this graph. This is basically the idea, the basic idea, how can you understand climate change? And it starts off with a nice car, and let's suppose we have the car in the desert or something like that. And that, uh, some of you have probably done things like I have where you parked your car in the summer and you forgot to crank the windows down. And what happens is it gets really hot inside the car. And so not a good idea. So let's explain that a little bit. So this is the sun. And as the sun comes, gives off energy, some of that energy comes to the earth. And some of it goes right through the window because that's what the window is transparent to those, those wavelengths. And what happens is uh, if you have your windows down, it's basically it heats up the inside of the car and then the car uh, radiates that stuff out through the, the, the opening windows and everything is fine. Now, if you crank your window up and you make your window height higher and higher, what happens is the car temperature gets higher and higher. And so uh, what you're doing there is you're simulating the greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect is like putting a, a one-way blanket over the earth that basically lets heat in but won't let heat out. And so that's, that's a model for you for the greenhouse effect. Now, we can keep track of uh, how we're doing globally in terms of climate change by looking at the temperatures. And ba so basically, this is like the last 20 years or so, and it's ranked uh, from 2001 is the it was the best result up to 2016 is the worst. 2016 was a little bit less good than 2019. So basically, this is this is how things have been going. You're getting worse and worse and worse over the last couple decades. And this is 2020, which turns out to have numbers exactly the same as 2016. So it's, it's tied for 2016 as the, as the, the worst, uh, worst year. So the, the hottest of uh, all these last six years have been these ones here. 19 of the hottest years on record have occurred since the year 2001. So for, for a lot of people, that would be enough of a, of a trend <laughs> to tell you something was going on and that, that things were heating up. But for some people, that's not enough. So let's go a little bit further. This is a guy, uh, Charles Keeling from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, I think of him as the smartest science guy I've ever met. The, the reason I say that is because he was able to talk to people at Scripps into giving him a full salary for spending all his time on a lovely mountain in Hawaii. 
And while he was on the, on the mountain, he decided to do some work. He measured carbon dioxide. And he had this passion to measure carbon dioxide better than anyone had ever done it on the earth. And so what he did, he had this very precise way of measuring carbon dioxide. And he found out that the values in the atmosphere changed seasonally. That uh, during the summer, they went down, they got lower during the summer, and they got higher during the winter. Lower in the summer, higher in the winter. So it begins to look like the planet is breathing. It turns out the reason for doing this is there's just, it's the vegetation. So the vegetation essentially is, uh, eats the CO2 in the, in the, uh, in the, in the time that, uh, that the, uh, of, of the summer and doesn't eat it as much during the winter. So that didn't get him in any trouble. But notice the slope of the curve. The curve goes up and up and up and up and up. That was the part that got oil companies nervous about his work. And so what they did is they declared his work was uh, useless and uh, should be abandoned uh, because it, there's this prediction that the, that the carbon dioxide is going to get larger and larger. And that would have implications on how much fossil fuel you could burn or how much carbon dioxide you'd have in the air. So they decided to, to test this by building seven stations at different places on the planet. So they took one at the North Pole, one at the South Pole, one at the edge of Russia, a place called Vladivostok, uh, one in Sweden in honor of uh, uh, Arrhenius. And they studied these seven stations for maybe about five, six years. And then they looked at the data and the data turned out to be exactly the same data that he was getting on this mountain in, in Hawaii. So this is the one piece that everyone agrees on in climate change, the so-called Keeling curve. Now what happens is during the time of Abraham Lincoln back in the 50s, 1850s, uh, we weren't admitting much in the way of uh, carbon. The, the society just was not that industrialized. The Industrial Revolution was a new thing, you know, where we basically got the idea of uh, 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 using uh, coal or oil instead of uh, uh, human labor. So, but what happens after, over time in the 50s, you see we have a bit more and then it starts to really take off. And so we're going like that. So at some point we exceed the capacity of the planet to absorb uh, the amount of stuff we're putting into the planet. So that's where we are today. We're basically exceeded that plant. The, the planet can't uh, take care of that much stuff. And so we're basically piling up more and more and that causes problems. We can keep track of the CO2 for a long period of time. Maybe that 20 year time we gave you earlier isn't good enough for you. So maybe we'll go back uh, a long period of time, back uh, uh, almost a million years. Uh, glaciers form whenever the snow forms in some sort of mountain uh, area. And if more snow comes during the year than the amount of snow that melts, it gets thicker and thicker. So uh, in the period of time when the snow isn't forming, like a ring forms there. So you can basically tell the age of each layer of the, uh, of the snow by starting at the top, which is what you know, and then counting on down. So it's sort of like counting tree rings. So you know exactly the timing. So what happens is with time, you get more and more snow. And then after it gets to be a big thing, which might be a couple of miles uh, deep, you basically can then go to that, that area with a drill that makes a core. It drills out a core of, uh, of ice. And you can take that core of ice and examine it. You basically have a core looking like that. You basically put it through a machine like a bologna slicing machine. It makes you a slice of it. And you take that slice and you give it to various chemists, various physicists, various geologists, and they make various measurements of it. And with that, they can tell what the carbon dioxide is back to about, about 800,000 years. So that gives you a long, much longer trend, which should be long enough for anybody. So if you look at that, what happens is you can measure one thing's the temperature. And this is how the temperature varies versus time. You start to the far right, and the temperature is uh, today's temperature, which is a high value. And if you go back in time, you get to a low value, and you go back and it gets to be high value again. So basically, if we go from the high value to the low value, the low value was the end of the last ice age. So we're talking about uh, roughly 10,000 years ago. So this is, a, this is the temperature of the earth going back roughly a million years. 
So you have pretty good data on that. And you can see it goes up and down. And we'll talk about why there's a theory that goes up and down. It's called the Milankovitch theory. We'll talk about that a little bit. But basically, you have seven or eight of these ice ages in this period of time here. And you get a good idea how that process works. Now, just to give you some idea of how we fit into the scheme, this is human existence. So it's basically, we've been around for, who knows, maybe 150,000 years, something like that. That's the, the sort of average science number. By the way, the numbers that I use in, in this series of eight talks, I, they're all scientific numbers, but scientific numbers vary somewhat over from a high number to a low number. I tend to love sticking to the middle of the, the numbers. So I'm right in the middle of the bunch. Not high, not low. So anyway, humans have been around maybe uh, 150,000 years. Now, the thing that causes the ice age is this. This is the Earth. The, the, if we go from the sun on out, we see a blue planet labeled the Earth. And then uh, further on out, we have a sort of an orangish looking planet with some bands on it. That's called uh, Jupiter. A little further out, we have Saturn. Those are two of the so-called giant uh, planets. Those giant planets have a gravitational effect on, the, on all the other planets, including the Earth. And so what they do is they cause the Earth to wobble, to tilt, and also to change its orbit. So that basically, when you put that data together, you have the so-called Milankovitch theory that predicts that, uh, that temperature distribution change over time. This is the precision. We normally uh, talk about the Earth pointing to the North Star. Well, that's true today. But uh, during the time of the Egyptians, uh, the Earth axis was pointing at the, at the star Vega. <laughs> so what happens is the Earth is like a, uh, like an, uh, a top that's wobbling. And so its axis sort of wobbles around. And the wobbling of that has something to do with our climate. Another impact is the uh, impact of the Earth's tilt of the axis. It changes from about 22 degrees to about 24 and a half degrees and back and forth. So again, that takes about 41,000 years. And the last impact is the uh, idea of the shape of the orbit. The orbit is not a circle. It's sort of like an ellipse, sort of like a squashed out circle. And that's, that eccentricity or that squashiness changes in a cycle of 100,000 years. You put those three things together and you get the Milankovitch theory that basically tells you uh, why the temperatures have been what they've been for about a million years. So we have a good handle on that. So anyway, this back to human existence here. Now let's measure something else. So let's measure carbon dioxide, since a lot of people are talking about carbon dioxide. And here we see the carbon dioxide. Again, if you look at the curve for the temperature, the pink curve, and you look at the green curve, what you see is that they're very similar. Darn things aren't exactly the same, but they're very, very similar. So it looks like that the, uh, whatever the, the carbon dioxide is, it is a strong determinant of what the temperature is going to be. So it has a heck of a lot to do with the temperature. Now look here, the temperature, uh, the carbon dioxide varies from in these units 180 parts per million to about, uh, about 280 parts per million. So it's roughly 100 parts per million from one low part to a high part. And it stays within that, those bands. So let's look at that for like about a million years here. That is the planet Earth uh, functioning within a safety zone. Okay. So what we know is that for the last million years or so, if you, as long as you keep the carbon dioxide within that safety zone, you're sort of okay. You might have some ice ages and so forth. You have some rides of the roller coaster, but you're pretty much okay. Let's see where we are today. There's today's concentration, about 400 parts per million. Well, well, far above the uh, edge of the safety zone. So we are in, uh, I think they used to call it terra incognito. We are in, into a system where we don't really understand what we're doing, <laughs> and God bless us. Roger Revelle, who was the founder of UCSD, uh, basically uh, said that we're performing a, a uncontrolled scientific worldwide experiment, and he wished us luck. <laughs> so that's where we are today. Let's see where we're going to be in the near future. If we continue at today's rate, Basically, we'll get to 600 parts per million in about 40 years. Now, you can make predictions of where, what things are like under, those, under that kind of high concentration. And it's, it's pretty miserable. I mean, you're not going to be able, you're not going to be happy at all. 
uh, death rates are going to be very high. Uh, the economy is going to be wrecked. Uh, if you think the migration we've seen so far is bad, you ain't seen nothing yet. So it would be good to avoid all those problems. In terms of modeling, what they do is they get big computer systems that take a couple of weeks to produce some data. And basically, the, they first of all examine what the temperature should be like if there weren't humans. And so that's the blue area, the blue curve. So they do that for roughly 1900 to 2000, roughly a century. And what they find out is it pretty much goes along a straight line there, some wobbles in it. Then they superimpose on that data, the data of, well, the humans are emitting this sort of stuff. So we get the black line. The black line is the actual data. The pink is what's predicted. So the pink is a pretty good fit for the black line. It was uh, good enough for these guys to, uh, to get the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> so we think we have a good handle on that. And we basically uh, know that we just can't continue the way we were going because uh, it'll be disastrous for the whole planet. I mean, uh, you, uh, if you think the COVID problem is, is big, you ain't seen nothing yet. So this is going to be really big. Anyway, Jefferson tells us that, uh, that uh, life is not a free ride. <laughs> you know, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. I'd like to close on an idea of a, uh, a typical guy in the Midwest, uh, basically uh, doing his thing. And uh, he hears an announcement on the radio about the, a flood is coming. And so he does what any normal guy would do, and that is he ignores the announcement. So then pretty soon, the sheriff is coming down with his bullhorn. The flood is coming, the flood is coming, you must abandon, you must leave now and get the high ground. And this guy uh, ignores it again. So pretty soon, the Coast Guard cutter is, is, is driving down his street you know, in, the, in the floodwaters, <laughs> announcing, get out of your house, save your life. The guy said, no, 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 no problem at all. Uh, so uh, the guy ignores it, and uh, pretty, pretty soon uh, the water's up to his second story, and uh, the helicopter comes by, and he's hanging on the chimney, and, the, and they drop a ladder for him to get on the ladder, and he's, no, 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 I'm going to ride on that, no problem. You know? So pretty soon the scene changes to, from the earth uh, to, to the heaven, and uh, the guy... Uh, of course, is at the pearly gates, having a tough time there. And he's trying to uh, talk his way into uh, through the pearly gates, saying what a, all the wonderful things he's done in his life and how marvelous he's been and so forth and so on. And, uh, and they ex explaining to uh, the gatekeeper that uh, this, is, this is a real problem. And uh, he says, but the thing I don't understand is all my life I've been, been really a good person and in my moment of need, God has abandoned me. And all of a sudden, there's a flash of lightning from the sky, and a voice comes from the sky and says, uh, what do you mean, abandon me? I sent you a radio broadcast. I sent you a sheriff. I sent you a Coast Guard cutter, and finally a chopper. What's it take to get your attention? <laughs> so I hope, folks, hope I've gotten your attention. Thank you very much. It never ceases to amaze me what I learn every time I listen to to Tom. So thanks so much, Tom. And so let's go ahead and start with, some say that global warming has to do with changes on the surface of the sun. What does the science say? That, that's a great question. Uh, when, when, I, when I first went to uh, Chapel Hill after getting my, uh, my postdoc degree in environmental engineering, uh, a couple of weeks after that, I went to a talk there where they gathered in uh, a bunch of the world's most famous climate scientists, they ask them the question of what, what's happening to the climate. And uh, the basically, some of the guys said it's going to get hotter. Some of the guys said it's going to get colder. Some of them said it's going to get hotter and then colder. Some of them said it's going to get colder and then hotter. <laughs> so they were all over the map. It was just complete chaos. And one of the, one of, one of the, uh, of the, of the guys was a big uh, sunspot guy. And so basically he was saying it's all due to sunspots. So what happened is they you know, were obviously fighting with each other and uh, they went out and they started measuring the data and they found out that the sunspot stuff is, there is an effect, okay? There is an effect and they were able to measure how much the effect is, but it wasn't very big. So it turned out that the, uh, even though there's an effect due to sunspots and 
it's it's a fairly small. It's like a, a ten percent effect of the total effect. So that's that's about where it is today. It's a, there is an effect, but it's not not a real biggie. Okay, and then here's another one. Uh, can you comment on how you view what Biden and Congress might do or not do for the climate? Necessity of a worldwide carbon tax? Well, basically, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. And so what you have to do is you have to reduce, uh, the fundamentals are, you have to reduce uh, the things that cause the climate uh, to go up, the carbon dioxide, uh, the methane, uh, the uh, a few other uh, things, so, some of the chlorofluorocarbons, uh, sulfur, hexafluoride, that sort of thing. So you have to reduce all that stuff. Now, the, the sensible way to do it is, is the way they did it in LA, where they basically solved the problem. You make a big pie of, 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 of your emissions, and then you basically decide, okay, uh, we need to reduce it by, pick a number, 80%. Uh, in order to reduce it by 80%, what do we do? So what, one is the democratic way. You say, well, hit everybody with the same reduction. Well, the economists will scream at that because they'll say, well, it doesn't make any sense because these guys, we could reduce them by 95%, uh, much cheaper than reducing these other guys by 80%. So you have to basically fight out the plans for reductions. So that's what comes in, in with, a, uh, with a climate plan, essentially. And some of, those, some of the cities have come up with decent climate plans. One of the be best of the first ones that came out was actually San Diego's uh, climate action plan. So the cities have these plans. States have some plans. Now, they might have some ragged edges that need to be fixed. And that's always true for anything that you do. But uh, basically, you, you get a plan of, OK, we're going to reduce this part of the society, the, the manufacturing part by X percent. We're going to reduce transportation by Y percent. Uh, we're going to reduce uh, agricultural by Z percent. And that's how you work it out at the top level. And then you parse it down. Then you get into how do you do it? Well, one of the things like in transportation uh, is uh, kind of a, a simple thing to do in some sense, and that is to shift to electrical cars. Because it turns out that uh, if you, uh, like if you're worried about air pollution, say in any, any big city, about usually about two thirds of it is caused by transportation. So if you shift to electric cars, you, you've solved most of that problem right by that shift. So a lot of cities around the world, uh, in China, uh, in Russia, all over the world, basically like that, that kind of thing. So we're gonna see a giant shift to electrical, en electrical energy just for the air pollution aspects of it. But if you start looking at uh, your whole economy uh, and you start comparing one source with another, like uh, say you take coal plants versus uh, uh, solar plants, it turns out that the economics are such that the solar is just one heck of a lot cheaper. It generates a heck of a lot more jobs. And so basically in terms of the effect on the economy, you'd be foolish to keep coal as a, as a major part of your activities, and you'd be smart to shift with solar. So that's the kind of way you do it. Same thing with wind and uh, other, other kind of thing, hydrogen. You let these things uh, compete with one another, which is good, it causes innovation. But there's, uh, turns out there's a great book, if you're interested in that sort of thing, called Draw Down, D-R-A-W-D-O-W-N, that basically gives you the cost effectiveness of a uh, 100 or so different uh, options and so the basic thing is that we should be pursuing these options independent of whether or not we even had a climate problem because it just simply would make us, our quality of life, a heck of a lot better uh, just because of the, uh, of the economies of it. That begins the answer to the question. Do you have any more, more details? I'd like to go into them if you do. All right, Tom, I heard you once before make a presentation about uh, something that was going on at UC Davis where they had con had a building, a new building was built. And one of the asked that this building was going to absolutely pay for itself within three years. This was some time ago. But one of the things that struck me about this building was the use of uh, uh, plant life on the, uh, on the top of the building. Do you remember that? Yes, 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 very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> the Drawdown book out from the Pasadena Central Library right now. And I am taking the four um, workshops that Cecily Stewart is doing on Mondays. And so I have to, I have to choose uh, an aspect of solutions, one of the hundred solutions, um, to research for next week. And oh my! Those, okay, what what are you leaning towards? Well, I want to do um, the, the green building, um, the the idea of tops of uh, green greenery on the tops of buildings. Okay, and is it I'll is it? I'm in touch with you. <laughs> I want I want it, to, during the week. Is it is it one of one of the workshops? Yeah, one of the uh, there are about I think there are about nine of us in uh, in the workshops this month, and um, so we've met twice already. And uh, so anyway, um, I'm finding what I like is the idea that it's not just one thing. That yes, make. yes, it's there's 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 such a room for creativity that uh, yes. is marvelous. Uh, I actually say one of the things that has struck me about the whole time of COVID is how much inventiveness has come out in the last ten or eleven months. People, well, yes, like we're using this Zoom technology, which we would never be using, right? Anyway. I I will be in touch with you later. What are you also going to touch on that on any of the eight sessions you're doing? Uh, yeah, during during the session that's called uh, climate change on us. Okay. That, the the, uh, the 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 subtitle of that could be drawdown. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um, we have two other questions now from the chat. Um, currently, the ozone hole is much smaller due to CFC regulation. What can this tell us about CO2? Uh, it basically tells you that uh, even though the problem is a difficult problem, uh, if, you, if you start to understand the science of it, and then if you go from the science to the uh, kind of the, uh, the technology parts of it, you can actually make a difference and solve the problems uh, in a cost-effective manner. So it basically says that you, you know, you really need, since these problems are so tricky, you really need to have some coherent approach uh, to the solution. Okay, and kind of a related question. What happened to atmospheric CO2 in 2020 with fewer planes and cars out there and the oil market tanking with oversupply and decreased demand? Uh, gee, I, I don't really track every year, but what happens is uh, you might drop your emissions uh, significantly in one year and the CO2 might go up due to the complexity of the oceans, uh, uh, the complexity of the whole Earth system. So it's, it's not a simple thing. That's why, you know, you, you need to look at the uh, not just year to year kind of thing, but decadal kind of things to make sure that, that what you're doing makes sense for the complexity of your problem. Okay. Um, and then here's a, here's a question. What can we do if other countries like China don't do their part in fighting climate change? Well, you, you hear that a lot. I mean, you know, China is a competitor, uh, apparently a fairly uh, fierce competitor. And uh, you like to blame them for a lot of things. They have a, a, a problem with coal they basically decided to build a lot of coal plants. And what they're doing now is they, uh, they're trying to get rid of those coal plants as quickly as possible. My understanding of what makes China work is that it, it, they try to uh, make sure they don't have any internal revolts. And so what, they were, what they're starting to find out is that the environment is so lousy in many parts of China that of the people who are on the verge of revolt. And so this puts the uh, environment into a high level category where it says we better start fixing the problem. So what they're doing is they're phasing out the, uh, the coal much faster than they would be comfortable with normally. And what they're doing is they're phasing in things like wind and solar very rapidly. Like they put uh, more uh, solar up, I believe, in two years than the U.S. did in like 20 years. 
So they really are, uh, you know, superstars in terms of, you know, trying to uh, uh, get the new technologies in. Now they're still not doing it fast enough. So we have to uh, kind of arm wrestle them a little bit, you know, to get them to uh, basically, uh, basically be faster. I hope that gives you some, some uh, the, the Chinese question is a difficult one, but that, I think that gives you a little bit of the flavor of an answer. Oh, I, I think so. I see Mary Dell, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I read on my Facebook an article that um, Biden called or G called President G of China, and they had a conversation this week, and one and you know Biden talked the usual complaints about human right violations and everything else they're doing wrong, but the one thing that they did have in common was um, climate change and environment, and that's what they want. That's the one thing they, um, you know. That's one thing they agreed on. Okay, so that's, that's, this, this could be a uh, kind of a bridging kind of topic. You know, yeah. whenever, you, whenever you're negotiating with folks, you need to find something that you agree on. And then you yeah. kind of work from there. <laughs> um, so Dr. English, you said that the Chinese are not um, putting up their um, solar fast enough. How about the US? Uh, bo both of us could uh, improve our economies <laughs> and improve the world by uh, speeding up the installation of wind, solar, and other renewables. Yes. So, so I think that if you, if you take it from the point of view of, of what, what's an opportunity for you, both, both countries have a giant opportunity there to, uh, to do that. And hopefully Biden, well, I know in his plans, He's planning to significantly increase uh, the U.S.'s activities in all those areas because he sees it as a as a fountain of jobs. You get a lot more jobs out of a, a, a solar plant or a wind plant than you do out of a coal plant or a nuclear plant or whatever. So, you know, he, he basically is going to be biased towards the technologies uh, that produce more uh, more work. Thank you. Yeah, hi, Tom. Um, you know, you, you had the, the cartoon there with the frog in the pot of water. Yeah, and, right. And, and you said that, um, you know, we respond to uh, jolts, but not gradual things that sneak up on us. So what, what do you think it will take for most people to get climate change or global warming urgency, you know, so they, they don't, they won't be criticizing the government about usurping their rights? Or is that something for another talk? Well, no, I, I think that's a good question. The, uh, I love the question. The, the way I would see it is to, the way you get around opposition is through uh, things that are beneficial. So if you create a heck of a lot of jobs, you know, in, in solar and in wind and uh, other renewables, then what will happen is your opposition will drop like a rock. Yeah. Uh, it, the economy should should basically boom also because you're you're doing things that are much more cost effective than you were doing before, so you can accomplish so, the same functions much cheaper. So basically, if the leadership takes it on and makes it happen. Uh, the public will change their minds because they'll feel better about a lot of other things. I, I think the numbers, I don't have the current numbers, maybe Becky might have something on that, but I think the numbers are already pretty favorable with the general public in terms of renewables. My guess is they're somewhere like in a 60% number, something like that. So I don't think it's a hard sell. Okay, thanks. Here's, here's a question, Tom. Should we all install solar on our roofs? Is it significant? Uh, I would I would say first of all uh, no, because some places uh, you know you're not going to make any money on it. But but basically yes, if you can make some money. And my understanding is that there is a giant market out there uh, that would let many 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 people uh, install solar, especially if you're considering to shift your car from a uh, fossil fuel car uh, to an electric car. 
So I think the market is gigantic, but I, I, I don't like to come up with solutions that say everybody should do this. <laughs> Understand. Uh, here's another question. If we're moving away from coal, how are we generating electricity now? That is a good one for our, our talk, uh, let's see, called on the uh, January, February, March, the th March the 11th, called Energy Futures. And what we do in that talk is we compare uh, coal plants with solar, wind, and nuclear. So we get a comparison, economic comparison, environmental comparison, job comparison, and so forth. And that way you have a, you have a, a coherent way of answering that question. But uh, I have to let you, de let you delay until another month or so for that. Okay. And Katya has a question. I do believe that modern technological fixes can make a big difference, but in your opinion, is there hope it will ever be enough? I fear our modern lifestyle, which is completely disconnected from nature, is really not sustainable. Amen. Well, I, I think that what we should do is, is get a lifestyle that is favorable for us. So in doing that, for example, it might require some changes in what we normally do. Like, for example, I think it's generally good for people to go for walks. So if you were to have more people spending time walking, what you would do is, is, is pr pr produce an improvement in their quality of life. Other improvements might be in, in uh, the food that they eat. You might find that there are some foods that are new to you uh, that might be far better for your, uh, your cardiovascular system uh, than the ones you're currently eating. So this may, may by shifting to some of these, uh, these foods partially, you may be able to live a much longer period of time. So I, I would say go for the things that are beneficial uh, to uh, the quality of life. And I think that would be uh, good enough to sell to a whole lot of people and also big enough to solve the problem. Now, if you look at the spiritual aspects of it, that maybe, just maybe, you're not functioning very well in terms of uh, the way you're getting along with the rest of the universe. <laughs> so maybe you need to re-examine your kind of your, your lifestyle, uh, what you do, what's important to you and so forth. And uh, I've always been a believer that there are uh, always opportunities lurking there if you, if you care to look. I love the optimism, Tom. Well, if there are no questions, I'd like to thank you all for your, for your attention. I, I love the, uh, the Q&A part. That's, uh, that's the fun part for me. And I'd like to uh, uh, have you come back next time. And if, if you really like this, invite some of your friends. So thanks again. All right. Thank you all. Thank you so much. We'll okay. see you next week. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>